If you followed the previous videos in the geometry and design series, you're now at a point where you have a sufficient core of geometric knowledge and constructive techniques for the purpose of creating your first furniture design. In this workshop, I'll demonstrate a process that I follow when designing a new piece of furniture. Specifically, it's going to be a desk with a single drawer on it, so it's not going to be an overly complicated piece of furniture this first time around. You should try to follow along. Pause and replay the video as many times as you need to, and feel free to modify aspects of your own design to fit your own particular needs, even if you don't plan to build this desk. So this design process that I follow tends to be broken up into phases. And the first phase is to create a list of design criteria. These should be things that your piece of furniture should be, you know, critical properties that your piece of furniture should have in order to fit your particular needs. They could include some physical dimensions that the design must fit into. Um, it can include design features that you want the piece of furniture to include once it's built. Um, you might want to um, make a statement about where the piece of furniture is to be used. Is it an indoor piece? Is it an outdoor piece? Uh, what kind of lighting is it going to be subjected to? You might want to put some thought into the materials that you're likely to build this piece of furniture out of. Um, all of these kinds of things could influence how the design itself goes together. So in our example, my criteria might look something like this. First of all, I'm going to be concerned about some critical dimensions. I'm going to stand at this particular desk. It's going to be kind of like the standing drafting table that's just slightly out of frame in, in these videos. So I'm going to stand at it when I work. And so I would like for the height of the desktop to be at a comfortable height for me to write. And that typically means if I'm standing straight up comfortably, then I want the bottom of my wrist to rest on that desktop when my elbow is hanging down comfortably and my forearm is bent at about a 90 degree angle. So, the height should be at wrist level. My elbow is bent 90 degrees. Now that's a personal dimension. It's not necessarily a numerical one. I mean, sure, I could measure it, but I'm, I, I don't we're going to see that I don't really have any need or even desire to know what that measurement is in inches or centimeters. Now there's going to be some other critical dimensions. The desk is going to be against the wall, and I'd like to be able to reach the back of the desk. I can't keep my book open, so I'll just hold it. The desk is going to be against a wall. And so if, if you imagine the desk being right up against me when I'm, I'm writing, I'd like to be able to reach out to the back of the desk and get whatever is back there without having to strain to bend over to, to, to get at things that are there. So the front to back. front to back depth of the desk ought to be reachable when standing. Now, maybe it's not a bad idea to
draw some stick figures to illustrate what I mean by these criteria. I can hear my goats actively wandering around on the other side of this shop wall again. You'd think that I don't feed them, but I do. Well, that looks ridiculous. My arm really isn't that long, but let's try again. <laughs> I ought to be able to comfortably reach the back without having to strain or bend over. And then the last criteria, and luckily I don't have to draw any stick figure drawings for this one, the desk should be no more than 60 inches wide because of where it's going to go in my office. Now, I did state a numerical uh, dimension for that one um, because I could imagine going into the space in the office where I'm going to set this desk and actually getting a tape measure out and um, measuring the distance. But even that isn't necessary. I could have just gone to the space in the office where the desk is going to sit and just got a long stick and marked off the width on that stick where the desk must fit and know that I can't make a disc any longer than that. So, width is less than or equal to 60 inches to fit in uh, allocated space. So those are three critical di dimensions that I've decided upon for this design. Not every design will have that many critical dimensions. Sometimes there will be more, sometimes there will be fewer critical dimensions that you have to satisfy. I would say though that the fewer that you can get away with, the better off you're going to be because it gets to be a little bit of an optimization problem juggling all of those critical dimensions and making sure that they work together, especially if they are precise dimensions rather than just sort of vague about wrist high or reach long kinds of dimensions like that. But those are dimensions that I could mark out on a stick and, and work with later on. In fact, we'll see that I do that. All right. Other design criteria. Might be some design features, design elements that this piece of furniture should have. So I want a drawer. I want a single drawer. right under the desktop uh, for me to store things like pens and pencils and calculators and stuff that I'd work with. But I also want the underside of the desk to be open so that I can store a tall sitting stool underneath of it that I can pull out and sit at and work, still work at the desk whenever I get tired of standing. So I don't want to make a big solid block of a desk. So I want that kind of space. I've run out of room. That's okay. I'll just state the, um, the last design criteria because in this case, it's not going to impact what we do in terms of design that much. Other, other than when we get to talking about how I'll join the individual components of this desk together later on. And so that's the material criteria. I'm going to build this desk out of solid wood. I'm gonna build the top out of a solid slab of maple. I have several of them from a tree that came down in a flood a number of years ago. Um, 
And then I'll probably make the legs and undercarriage frame out of walnut or other pieces of maple, something along those lines. But it's, it's going to be solid pieces of wood. And so I need to be thinking in terms of the material properties of wood and how I can um, reliably join that wood together in ways that takes advantage of its strength rather than ways that it could be undermined by its weakness uh, when I'm thinking through my design. So that brings us to the next phase, is that once I've got myself settled on my basic design criteria, once I've, I've, I've settled on that, that basic design criteria, then I want to keep it all in mind and do some rapid sketches, some brainstorming of pictures of desks. Preferably several. Pictures of desks that I think might stand a chance of living up to those design criteria. And so what you should do if you're going through this process is get a big piece of paper or if you're lucky enough to have just built a chalkboard in your shop, divide it up into some number of, of spaces where you're going to do each of one of your sketches. And these are going to be fast sketches. You want to try to go for less than a minute for each one if possible, but you know, it's not a hard and fast rule. The point isn't to get all of your proportions and design features accurately laid out. You're just trying to come up with some representative, representative sketches of the beginnings of a design that you could refine later after choosing that that design is the one that uh, meets your criteria. So, you know, I just need to remember that I'm working on a tall desk that's got a drawer and space underneath and uh, as um, certain certain dimensions and it's going to be made out of wood. And so, you know, I might try something that's more of a shaker informed Normally I wouldn't erase in this phase, but I slipped on the chalkboard. Design, I might try something that is maybe got a little bit heavier top on it. Some battens underneath, and it's got these tapered legs staked up through the batten. Maybe I've got some stretchers the undercarriage of those legs and I just hang that drawer underneath in a frame. Or what else could I do? I could try something that maybe is a little bit more ornate. Tabletop with bevels cut on the underside. legs that taper down to a point. You have some sort of an apron that stops off into a drawer frame. And I guess I could put some stretchers to stabilize the underneath, but maybe I'm gonna not do that on this one. I'll experiment with I mean, what this thing looks like without them. Then I could also imagine taking even more modern approach. I've got all these maple slabs. 
so I could make a design where the sides are made out of slab as well. And they're just joined waterfall edges. And I don't know if I'd want to put some sort of a panel in the back to kind of help support things. Maybe some boards that tongue and groove joined to each other. And then again, maybe hang a drawer down and some sort of a box. And so I've gone through this process now and I've quickly at least drawn the front elevation view of four different candidates for a desk. And so if I've, my next phase would be to look at those candidates and think through what it would take to construct them and consider maybe how I feel about them aesthetically, which one I think just looks better. Um, and think of which ones are maybe going to make the most use or best use of the materials I happen to have on hand right now. And just as a gut feeling, I could look at these two and say, you know, I, I think these two would serve my purposes the best right now. I'm not I've seen people do nice things with waterfall and joints out of slab furniture, but um, I, don't, I don't want to necessarily use up as much of my slabbed wood as it would take to make a design like this. I'm not sure that I'm excited about that because I would also say that that's somewhat of a current fad and trend to make these giant slab desks with waterfall ends and it would be a shame to waste that much wood on something that's maybe likely to go um, out of favor. Um, and then I, this one I just don't like. I, you know, I tried to make um, uh, this design and it's perhaps something that I could come back and refine a little bit at another time but at this point I just don't like it. So I'm, I'm really down between these two. And I could see either one of them working and serving my, my purposes. I think the second one is a design that could really make some good use of some curved design elements. And so what I'm thinking I would like to do is hold on to this basic idea for a desk with a drawer on it and return to it at a later date once we've developed some of our design skills that involve laying out curves geometrically. Because I think some curved elements could look really nice in a design like this. So that brings us back to this, this more of a shaker inspired uh, design where I've got some legs that still are tapered and well, reverse tapered. They splay out to uh, a wide piece on the bottom and they're narrower at the top. This is just a single drawer in the middle. These are just um, um, face panels that are fixed. And then I'd have to figure out in this design how this stretcher arrangement that stabilizes the, uh, the structure is going to work out uh, to allow me to store a stool underneath. So that's really what brings me to the next phase of this design process, is that once I've narrowed my focus on to which desk I want, I should probably re refine that design a little bit. And so let's take that picture, maybe add a side elevation view to it so that we can make a little bit more sense of what's going on with the stre stretchers. Remember this desk wasn't going to be that deep so that I could reach. And now I'm no longer really brainstorming, so I'll try to freehand sketch this a little bit more carefully. I would just connect those legs at the top with an apron, just a board that's 
connected with mortise and tendon joinery. We'll talk about that in a future uh, installment of this, this design workshop. And then on these legs at the base, I can imagine maybe having this stretcher or stabilizer that goes across and is mortised into tenons that I've cut into these legs. And so this horizontal stretcher it goes between the two sets of side legs. Rather than embedding that in the front legs, where you know that would block me from being able to store a stool underneath that desk, what I'm actually going to do is that I'm going to tenon that into these stretchers themselves towards the back. So that leaves a pretty good sized bay available underneath the desk where I could put my feet or I could, could put a stool when I'm not working at the desk or when I'm just standing at the desk. So that's, that's kind of the rough idea of where I think it's maybe worth going with a design like this. But I need to translate that rough idea to one that satisfies my design criteria more carefully. And in particular, what I need to do is, is determine some preliminary ratios between the height, width, and depth of this de desk. I need to come up with a three-dimensional bounding box that this desk is going to fit in so that it, it lives up to my design criteria. My, remember, I want the height to be chosen so that if I stand with my elbow comfortably hanging down, my wrist is just going to set on the desk if my elbow is, my forearm is at a 90 degree uh, angle with my, um, my upper arm. I want the width to be no more than 60 inches and I want the depth to be no more than I can reach without having to, you know, really bend over and strain on this desk. So if I measure my bent arm wrist height and my forward reach with a stick, I, I, I've done this. So I, I find out that they are in about an eight to five ratio. So the height to reach just, um, dimensions are in an eight to five ratio. So the height to depth of the desk, the height to the front to back depth of the desk, those are two dimensions that should be in an eight to five ratio. And then if I can, pair the height of the, the desk to the max, maximum width of 60 inches, those two uh, dimensions, height to width, are in about a two to three ratio. So the whole thing should fit in a box that I'm kind of drawing in perspective right now, where Height to width is in two to three ratio. And then height to depth is in an eight to five ratio. And as long as I keep those ratios in mind, then if I scale my design up so that the desired height is where I want it to be, then the width and the depth are going to fall naturally from that without me having to measure anything. So, with that in mind, I'm at a point where I can start carefully laying out the design of this desk. Okay, now that we've settled on a basic design, it's time to refine it and make sure it meets all of our design criteria and that all of the views, the front elevation, the side elevation, and the plan view, the top view, satisfy the whole number rational relationships that we chose. Namely, that the front view should be three units wide to two units high the side view should be five units wide to eight units high, 
and then the top or plan view should be 12 units wide by five units deep. So we need to set out bounding boxes for each of those views. And I'm gonna do that by starting to draw a baseline across the bottom of my paper. And on that baseline, I'm going to just step out that width just based off of an arbitrary compass setting. I'm gonna step out that width of once two, three units. So that's a width that's three units wide. Now I'm going to lightly draw perpendicular verticals at the ends, the right, the far right and left ends of those three units. Those are going to be the sides of my bounding box. I'm going to leave those light for the time being. Now, I know that those need to be two of these arbitrary steps high. So I'm taking a compass and taking two steps. So now I want to connect this point to this point. Slide my straight edge up to those spots. And I'll connect them. Now I can clean those up a little bit. So I don't need to see the extra lines poking up. Basically, I've got my three wide by two high bounding box. Now, over here, I want to draw, draw a similar bounding box for my side elevation view. So, I'm going to draw a height. And I want to try to divide that height, well, what I should do now is mark the top of that perpendicular side with a line that comes across. So this distance is the same as th this distance. That's going to ensure that my side and front elevation views are the same physical height on the page. Now what I need to do is divide this height up into eight even steps because the side elevation view needs to be eight units high to five units wide. So I'm gonna take a compass that looks about right and mark, walk it off to three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It looks like that's a little bit too far, but I'm also worried if I, I draw my line accurately or not. Looks like I might be a little off. It's okay, I'll just darken it. But still, I think I'm a little off. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tighten these compass points slightly. I'm gonna go up to the top and start walking down. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, Eight. And that lines up pretty well. So I'm going to mark those. One, two, back to where I can see them. Three, four. Whoop, walked right off the page. Five. Six, seven, and eight back to the top. Okay, so there's my eight even subdivisions. And I know width-wise I've got to go across five steps. So I'm going to go one, two, 
three, four, five. Now that step size is going to be, I'm going to keep my little compass set to that because that step size is going to be <clears throat> the common module that I use to relate all of the um, dimensions, all of the basic dimensions in this design as we build it up. Okay, so I've got, I'll erase this later, a three wide to two high bounding rectangle for the front elevation, and then a five wide to eight high bounding rectangle for the side elevation. <clears throat> so now let's start, <coughs> excuse me, let's start filling in the design features. I'm going to work on both of these elevation views from the top down. So the first thing I need to do is decide on a thickness for the tabletop itself so that I can draw another horizontal line across. Now, I need to, this is where I need to maybe think a little bit about material properties and actual dimensions for a minute. Um, the only actual dimension that I've really bothered to measure in this is that I know that this table is going to be about 60 inches wide. And so let's try to figure out what that means for this common module. So if I take one of these one-third subdivisions and step off what that means in terms of this common module, I've got one, two, three, four fit into this one-third division of the width. So if four fit into one of these, and there's three of them total, there's got to be four times three or 12 total steps of this compass from the left to the right, if I was willing to do all of them. So there are 12 steps of this common module size and the width of 60 inches. 12 into 60 is five inches. So at full scale, this compass setting represents about five inches of width. So by itself, that distance, one module down from the top, and I'll mark them both by making pin pricks and now making little pencil marks. By itself, that distance is, is um, too big for a tabletop. I don't want to have a five inch thick desktop. That would be overkill. But if I divided it into three, what I'd have in its place is a desktop that's five inches divided by three or one and a third thick. One, one inch and, a, and a, a third thick. Or one and two thirds thick. Just still maybe a little bit thick. So let's not even do that. Let's divide that top into quarters. Because if we do that, if we divide that top into quarters, then the five inch thick top that I started thinking was going to be ridiculous is only going to be one and a quarter inch thick. So that I can do. I can just divide this, divide that line in half and then divide it in half again. And you know, that might be a little bit tedious. So what I'm going to do instead is that I'm going to use the ruler and square technique. So I'm going to line up my ruler so that the zero is on that one module thick marking point and the four is lined up right on the tabletop. And I'm going to go through and just make a, in fact, I'm not even going to do it with a pencil. I'm going to do it with a pin prick. I'm going to put a hole in my paper where the one, the two, the three, and then ultimately the four would be. And so if I were to take my square then, lined up with the side of this bounding rectangle, then push its edge 
up against my pin prick. And that should give me a mark. I'll do another one here. That is one quarter of one module thick. Now, I could do the same thing on this side, but since I'm a little bit pressed for time and battery life on this camera, I'm going to use my sliding T-square to extend that tabletop all the way across both bounding rectangles. So there we go. We've drawn in a tabletop that is, if this is one module, or one eighth of the height of the table, then this is one module over four. Okay, that's how thick that is. Now, I think I should set another compass to that thickness because I'll probably use it again. It's nice to have several compasses laying around because they can store those settings. All right, so now I need to put the legs in. And what I think I'd like to do on this particular design is mark off a module step in from the bottom right and bottom left corners of both bounding boxes. And I've already done that over here. So if I do that, here I'll make tick marks so you can see them. There's one right there, one right there, one right there, one right there. Those would have all been measured by this compass, which is currently storing my one module setting. So I'm going to line up the ruler along that baseline again. I'm going to draw vertical lines at each of those tick marks. And what these vertical lines are going to do, going running from the floor up to the underside of that tabletop, is those are going to represent the inside edge of the legs of this table. I'll still have to draw the outside edge once I've de decided upon a leg thickness, that these are the inside edges. Okay. Now, as far as thicknesses go, remember this module here is five inches thick. So I don't, I definitely don't want my legs to be five inches thick at the base. That might look good on some designs, but I think that's a bit much on this one. What I could do is <coughs> just copy, since I've stepped it out, I could copy half the thickness. Yeah, maybe I didn't copy it. So what I'll do is bisect this distance in order to get half the thickness. I'm going to do that with this little compass. I'll do it real quick with our bisection method. Oops, this little compass is kind of on the cheap side. It's falling apart on me. There we go. So I'm going to swing an arc. Swing an arc. I'll erase these later. Swing another arc. And that one. That way I can connect those two with my ruler. Order to find that position of the leg. Now that is still two and a half inches thick, so that's quite a thick leg at the base. Now I can actually copy that dimension now. Set my compass to midpoint, plug the other point in that hole, 
And that way I can measure it in from there. And then I can measure it in from here. There. Alright, so. I'd like these legs to be slightly tapered. So I don't want to pick the midpoint up here to be the, the point that I connect the base of the leg to. I'd like to pick some other point that's going to make for a narrower leg. And maybe, maybe this is where I should divide that module into three pieces. And I can try to do that by just stepping, perhaps. So let's see if I can do it. There's one, two, three. That's a little small. I don't know if you can see that, but I'll make it bigger. Open the compass wider. One, two, three. A little bit small still, but better. One more try. One, two, now we're big. This is always tedious. Okay, now I've got it to where I've iteratively approached a dimension of one third of a module. So I'm marking that from the top inside of the table legs on all of these. See if we can get this compass to stay still. Now I can connect those marks. So this top mark that results in a leg that is one third of a module wide at the top. To the bottom one, which is a half of a module wide. And I'll, I'll mark each of those just so that I remember. I'll do the same over here. Those are my tapered table legs. And again, I can mark that as module, one third of a module, where this is one half of a module. I ordinarily wouldn't do that on a lot of my drawings. I'd probably draw a scale and maybe in a future video we can um, we can include scales, or maybe we'll have time to fit one on this one. Okay, my pencil's getting dull, so I'm gonna make a lot of noise. All right, I've got the legs drawn in. Now I need to get the drawer structure. So, <clears throat> I would like to take this, uh, let's think about this. Fourth of a module is an inch and a half wide. We might as well use that distance again. So I'm gonna reset my, comp my little utility compass here to that distance. And here's what I'm going to wanna do. In order to draw the drawer structure in, I need to have a support piece that stretches across between the tops of the two legs and ties them together above the drawer bay. So that's just going to be a thin flat board that is one quarter of a mar module wide. There and there. So I'll draw that in. So this is going to be the framing above where the drawers sit. So much for a sharp pencil. Let's get that tip out of here. All right, now below that, 
I'm going to make the rest of the drawer assembly just stretch down an entire module. Just because. I could do some other choice, but I think that'll make a sufficiently deep drawer. And then, it's the entire unit, so I've got to put, you know, framing to support the drawer above it. I've decided to go above it so that I get kind of a shallow drawer and not below it because I am trying to conserve space down here where I can store a stool when I'm not sitting on it. So I'll connect those two lines. Now, this entire drawer here, if that was one drawer, that'd be about 50 inches wide. And that's a little bit over, in fact, it'd be exactly 50 inches wide. That's a little bit overkill for a drawer. I don't want a drawer to be that wide. So what I'm going to do is mark in some vertical dividers that will keep a drawer in the center that will slide out. And then there's just going to be fixed panels over dead space here because I don't really want side drawers on this particular design, just because. So what I might do is just take, eh, I guess I could take the middle third for a drawer. We'll try that. See how that looks and if I decide I want to move it, I'll, I'll move it. So I'm going to do this carefully. I'll use my T-square on the baseline so I can lock the triangle to each of these marks and say, well, here's one edge of the drawer, a third of the way in from the left of the bounding rectangle. Here's the other edge of the drawer, a third of the way in from the right of the bounding rectangle. And now what I think I'd like to do is draw support pieces on either side of that drawer that are going to be half a module high. And I've got my half a module mark down here that I can go copy again. There it is, half a module wide. So to make that work, I'll just put a mark. Another mark, a mark, another mark, and then connect those. I'll just use my square as a straight edge to do that. All right. So this part is the drawer. These are just panels that are fixed in place. And we're almost done. The last thing I want to do is draw in some horizontals. Well, I've got two more things to do, I guess. To match the height of this drawer structure, I want to extend the bottom edge of that drawer structure over here onto the side view. And what that's going to be is just one big apron piece at the top of the legs that sits below the table. And that'll probably be attached to the legs with a drawboard mortise and pin. And so I'll just kind of eyeball the pins that are going to hold those in just to Help me remember that they're going to be there when we're going into details on the joinery later. Okay, now the last thing to do is draw in some, some uh, supports in the undercarriage of this because with these tall legs this could be a pretty floppy table if they're not tied together somehow. And I'd like to do that with some rungs or stretchers. And so what I thought I would do is have a stretcher that its top lies at the midway point along the height. So I'm going to line my ruler up with those midway height points and draw a line that goes between the legs on both the front and side elevation views. Then 
I'm going to make those stretchers pretty beefy. I'll make them a full module wide, five inches wide. I just really only need to do it over here. And that'll really add some stability to this design. Oops. So on the sides, those will likely be mortised into the sides of the legs as well. Now, this piece here, I don't want it so far to the front of the table that it's going to be bumping my knees when I'm standing at it. And more importantly, I don't want it to block my ability to store the, um, the uh, stool underneath the table if I ever draw and design that. However, I don't want to move it all the way back to where it's attached to these back legs and then going left and right, because then there's really not very much horizontal support that's going to keep the front legs from um, kicking in or splaying out. So a compromise is that perhaps I could come in, let's see, where was it? Perhaps I could come in, yeah, there we go, half a module We'll do it up here where I can see it. Half a module from the uh, inside of this back leg. And I'm only gonna draw this lightly because this is actually a hidden line. Real lightly. And what that is, is that's the back edge of this stretcher. And so if I were to make that out of this same kind of material here, this inch and a quarter material, then I would have to imagine the front edge of that stretcher, even though it's hidden, it would be oriented about here. And the only, but the only thing that you'd maybe see from that stretcher when you're looking at the side is maybe there'd be three little finger tenons. I'm just gonna sketch these in in the interest of time. Didn't really get them distributed as evenly as I'd like, but you get the idea. Poking all the way through that side stretcher. And so that would mean you'd have all of this distance here under the table to store a stool and you know not not bash your knees. So that's how this is the edge, the end of this horizontal piece going through the side stretcher. Now finally, last thing that I need to do is draw in the bounding box for the plan view of basically the tabletop. And there's not going to be much to this view. It's really just going to be a rectangle that's the full 12 modules wide by five modules deep. So I'll go ahead and set my square up to a place where I'd like to draw that lightly at first, the uh, bottom edge of the, the um, or the really would be the front edge of that tabletop. And then I'm going to project the left edge of the front elevation view bounding box up through that new baseline. And then the same with the right edge. So just move my square over to line up with that right edge. Okay. Now, what I need to do is take my compass and copy this five module width of the side elevation view and cut those verticals from the baseline up so that they are the right depth of that tabletop. Then bring my sliding T-square up to those, 
darkening that line. And I missed a little bit, but that's okay. Race the overshot lines. Fill in Darken the, you know, the front and back lines. Darken the sides. Now I have a not overly spectacular picture of a rectangle. And that rectangle is just our tabletop. It is 12 modules wide by five deep because of the way I've copied this 12 module width off of the front elevation view and the five module depth of the side elevation view. And so that gives me the plan view or the top view of the table. And at this point, we've got the three primary views of this table. And depending on your level of experience with building pieces of furniture like this, this might be quite sufficient for you to get started. You could just go and figure out the joinery for how these stretchers connect to the legs or how the drawer box and support structure works. Um, or that might still be a little bit of a mystery. And so what I will do is add one more installment, so it'll be part two to this design tutorial, where we draw some close-up views of things like the mortise and tenon joinery that connects this long horizontal stretcher through to the side uh, pieces, or the mortise and tenon joinery that puts the side stretchers into the legs or the side apron into the uh, tops of the legs, and then talks a little bit about how this drawer structure goes. Now, maybe I'll even do a little little drawing of, of, of the drawer. That might be overkill for this design. I, I, I don't know. Well, we'll see how it goes. But that is, for, for the most part, that's the end of this overall design process that gets us to where we've got a pretty decent and pretty accurate representative picture of the, uh, the furniture piece itself and how all of its components fit together you know, with the exception of really exploring the joinery. So thanks for watching and uh, hope you'll join me for the next installment of this design tutorial. After working through the tail end of this design tutorial, I decided that instead of creating a standalone second installment where I work step by step through each of the joinery details for how the stretchers connect to the legs and the same with the side and back aprons and how the drawer frame details work together and even how the drawer box itself works. I thought it would be best just to draw those designs up in advance and then go over them and how they relate to this overall big picture in a detailed sense. Um, and that way we're not spending a lot of time watching tedious constructions and subdivisions over and over again. We can just see how, we can imagine how we would have come up with, with these designs. And so I'm gonna start with how this side apron and this side stretcher ties into the pair of legs on this either <clears throat> either side of the table. Okay, so that's going to look, try to get the light right on this. I know it's a challenge. As I might have mentioned earlier in this tutorial, I had a, I planned to attach the, the apron and the stretchers to the legs on the side anyway with mortise and tenon joinery. And what that is, is that on each end of the apron and each end of the stretcher, there is a tongue called a tenon 
that's thinner than the apron or stretcher itself and protruding forward. And then that plugs into a socket that's cut or carved out of the accepting face of the, the leg, both at the top and the bottom. This shorter stubby shoulder is called a haunch. And what that does is that it leaves more material at the top of this leg to give it strength and keep it from splitting out. But this little bit resists twisting of the, the uh, apron in the socket. And that's unnecessary down here where the tenon is uh, plugging into a mortise that's got a lot of leg material above and below it uh, for stability. Um, so that joint is on the f on both ends of both the side apron and the side stretcher. Now we can also see a close-up on this side stretcher of what looks like three blocks that are protruding through it towards us. What that is is uh, I did a freehand sketch last uh, t time we were finishing up this overall design. That's these three finger ends of this wide back stretcher that ties the left assembly uh, of legs to the right assembly of legs. And it pokes through these tenon, uh, these mortise holes uh, right on the face of, of the, the either side stretcher. And so a close-up for what's going on is that that long back stretcher has three fingers cut into it, spaced evenly from top to bottom of the stretcher that plug into three mortise sockets that we can see the ends of right here. So that's a good example of where we can use one of our design techniques because I've divided this vertical space here and here into seven equal segments and it's the middle three segments that form the mortises on the stretcher that accept the three middle three finger tenons on the uh, back stretcher. Okay, so get this out of the way for a second. That takes care of all of the joinery here, 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 and then on the side aprons and, and a back apron that isn't really appearing on this picture that goes front to back. What we still need to look at is how this webbing, this framing that creates the drawer box, the place for this middle drawer to go and holds these front panels together. Need to look at a little bit more detail on how that all fits together. And so <clears throat> try to look at them side by side here. This long piece along the top, this long kind of horizontal stretcher that forms the top edge of the drawer box, that is going to tie the top of the left front leg together to the top of the right front leg. And I want to do it in a way so that the, the legs are going to resist that piece pulling out. So rather than plugging them into another mortise and tenon socket, I'm actually envisioning cutting a dovetail on the end. So now we're looking at the top, looking straight down on this piece in this, this view. So we've got a dovetail that fits into a dovetail shaped socket right on the top of the leg, straight going straight down into the leg. And um, a little tenon socket that's going to um, just plug into a, uh, a, uh, a, a small mortise on the side apron. Below the drawer bay, there's a very similar piece, but this one will just plug in to a, it'll have a tenon on the end that plugs into a mortise on the side of the leg. Now, those two pieces are symmetric. They, they join to the tops of the legs the same way, right and left side. But it's this middle third piece that contains the drawer bay, and that has to be separated by these vertical dividers. So that is a piece. Here's one of them that's drawn where it stretches from the bottom to the top drawer frame and plugs into both of them with a small mortise and tenon joint. And that, that's all that's holding that together. 
Now, this little dotted vertical line here, what that represents is that if we're looking at the drawer fronts and the fixed panels, this stuff here front on, what's behind this piece is another board that uh, we're just looking at the, at the front end of that board, and it's a divider for the drawer bay. And so it is going to go front to back underneath the tabletop in this direction so that it sets up a space for the drawer to set in. And so that piece plugs in to these, the back side, the back face of these vertical dividers with a, another small mortise and tenon joint. And there's, there's two of those. There's one shooting straight back from here and one shooting straight back from there. And what that's going to do is that it's going to provide a space, it's going to provide blocking that keeps the drawer from racking to the left or the right when you open and close it. <clears throat> and that would, I didn't draw it in this picture, but that would tie into the rear apron of this tabletop, maybe with a small stub mortise and tenon again. Okay, and so then the last thing to look at is the drawer box itself. So the drawer box is right here. How does it as assemble? Well, it's pretty straight pretty pretty um, common drawer assembly is to dovetail the, the drawer box itself. And what I'm looking at here is a side elevation of the uh, side elevation view of this drawer box. I'll try to hold my paper down. It's not cooperating. All right, so the side of the drawer itself attaches to the back with uh, an array of dovetail joints. And I have started the back, the top of the drawer, and then stopped the back short of the bottom of the drawer for a reason why I'll explain in a minute, but uh, three dovetails are enough to hold that drawer back to the um, drawer side. And those dovetails are just spaced evenly. So I divided the space from here to here into even spaces, three even spaces with a chosen gap between each one um, uh, to, ma to make that joint. <clears throat> the front, the drawer front goes all the way from the top to the bottom and I've divided that space up to accept four dovetails. These dovetails do not go all the way through to the front. They're called half blinds. So you won't see them when the drawer is fully closed, but they'll still you still have these four dovetails spaced evenly fitting into sockets in the end of the drawer front. And this is on both the right and left side of the drawer. Drawer also needs to have a bottom and that's what's being represented by these dotted lines. So this top dotted line is the top of the bottom panel. This middle dotted line is the bottom of a groove that that whole panel slides into. And then this bottom up dotted line, just a little bit above the bottom edge of the drawer frame itself, is the bottom of the panel. And so that panel has a long tongue all the way around it that fits into a groove that's been cut in the sides and the front uh, of the drawer. But this gap here has been cut away from the back that allows me to slide the bottom panel in and remove it if I ever need to. And then it would just be held in place by driving some screws or nails up through the back end of that drawer panel into the back edge of the drawer. <clears throat> All right, and so that's, that's really how that would go together. And the point of that overview isn't really to teach you how to build a drawer if you don't know how to do that. It's really just to show how uh, some of our design techniques, in particular dividing up spaces evenly for things like dovetails, fingers of mortises, um, can be used to lay out your joinery in a careful, thoughtful way. So that marks the end of this overview of our, well, it marks the end of this, this first design workshop for, for laying out, using the techniques we have so far, uh, a design for this, this standing desk with a, with a single drawer. Where we're gonna go from here, because it also marks the end of really our first unit in this geometry and design series. So where we're gonna go from here is we're gonna spend 
little bit of time making a middle unit in the series that pays careful attention to the concepts of ratio and proportion and looks at some additional techniques for how we can construct segments, lengths, distances, however you want to think about it, that exist in certain rational relationships to each other. Now, of course, we can already do that by just carefully dividing our segments up into some number of steps and then using those steps to mark off other distances elsewhere in our design. But there are some faster ways to do that. And once we put concepts like similarity of triangles or similarity of just figures for that matter in, into place, we can develop a, another design tool that will go right along with our layout square, our straight edge and our compass. This, this tool is going to allow us to quickly calculate proportional or rational relationships between two links. And it's a, cool, it's a tool called a, a sector. They're a little bit hard to come by, but uh, when we get into that section of our, our tutorials, I'll provide you a link where you can at least get a, um, a paper cutout of, of a sector that you can use for the time being. I'll also provide a link or two for um, I'm at least aware of one commercially available sector, but it's it's not cheap. So um, it's 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 worth it if you'll do a lot of work like this. Uh, you might want to get your feet wet with the paper one first, though. So after we spend some time on a shorter middle unit looking at uh, proportional rational relationships between links and learning about concepts such as similarity and learning how to use the sector. We'll move on to our final unit where we um, spend some time working out how to lay out curved design elements that can go into our designs. So if we made it this far, there's, there's more to come and I hope you'll continue to join us. Thank you.